Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday night. We thank and praise God for allowing us to make it through the stormy weather on today. Our scripture tonight is Psalm 55, 22 through 23. Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. But you, O oh God, will send the wicked down to the pit of destruction. Murderers and liars will die young, but I am trusting you to save me. Verse 23 again says, but you, O oh God, will send the wicked down to the pit of destruction. Murderers and liars will die young, but I am trusting you to save me. Hallelujah. We have to put all of our trust in Jesus the Christ. Put our burdens, take our burdens to him, and guess what? He can handle our burdens. He is able enough. He can do it. He's big enough. So we just have to take those burdens to the Lord and just leave them there. Our song is glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Friends, don't treat me like they used to. And guess what? I'm going home to live with Jesus. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory. your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father, for blessing us another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come before you. We thank you, Father God, that you're good and you're God. We glorify you. We magnify you. We lift you up, Father God, for you are worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. We thank you again, Father, for blessing us to come this far, be about your business. And now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives. Keep us focused and Bless us to be about your will and your word and your way. Bless your word tonight, Father God, that will fall on good soil, that men, women, boys, and girls will know that Jesus Christ is the victorious one. We pray that you bless us now, Father God, as we dive into your word, that your word will be clear, your word will be relevant, and your word, Father God, will speak volumes to us. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Amen. Good to see everybody out again tonight. Joining us for our uh, midweek Bible study. Thank you so much for being a part of our service on tonight. We're so glad that you have come to be a part of our service 
on tonight. Again, we're back in Philippians chapter 4. This is the first few chapters of chapter 4. We're again in the book of Philippians. Tonight, we're in chapter 4. We want to thank God for a privilege of joining you tonight and you joining us for such an awesome study in the Word of God. God has truly blessed us and been a part of this study thus far, and we want to continue tonight in that vein. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. We'll be doing verses 1 through 7 on tonight. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, it's where we will be on tonight. Thank you again, Sister Davis, for reminding us that Jesus is the reason for us being here. And if we're going to worry about anything, we ought to put those burdens on him. And that is what we're talking about on tonight. Paul is writing, writing to the church at Philippi from the Roman jail. Again, I want to emphasize the fact that he's writing. And as he's writing from, from this Roman jail, he, he's not worried. <laughs> Uh, too many times we are too worried about things. We, we are worried about things that we can't fix. We're worried about things that we can't have control of. But uh, the Apostle Paul gives a great example to us throughout this book of Philippians. As he writes to the church at Philippi, I say to you, he's writing also to us on tonight. So let's dive right in and let's look at verses 1 through 7. The first verse, it, it deals with the fact that he, he has a beloved congregation. This congregation is the church at Philippi. And as he addresses this church at Philippi, as he has done throughout verses 1, 2, and 3, he addresses them again. He says, Therefore, brethren, my beloved, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren. This word brethren suggests to us and tells us that he's talking to those who are born again, those who are saved. Those who love Jesus the Christ, those who have, have walked with him, and those who have, have uh, confessed Jesus as Lord, Paul is talking to you on tonight. He's talking to us, reminding us that Jesus Christ is the one that has brought us together as brothers. No, we weren't born biologically as brothers, but because we love the coming of Jesus Christ, because we believe the story that Jesus died for our sins and, and rose again, because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, because we believe and receive Jesus as our Savior, we are all brothers and we are all sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, and long for brethren. He says that we ought to know that he, he loves us. This word love is, is a social type of word. It is a brotherly love that we ought to have for each other. We ought to have brotherly love for each other. Regardless of what we do, regardless of how we find people to be, we ought to always have love, that brotherly love for each other. We ought to love people with a love that, it, that will not discard us from each other. He addresses it, and you're going to see later on in verses 1 and 2 why he addresses them as brothers, as he addressed them as sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. He, this word love is the same word as agape, meaning that, that we get this love from God. We get this love, and we have this love, and it is an unconditional type of love. We love each other in a brotherly love situation and we do it regardless of the circumstances some folk will love you if you give them something some people will love you if you if you do good things for them paul is saying we are brothers and sisters in christ jesus today and regardless of how things work out between us we ought to have love for one another he says i yearn for you he says i long for you this word long means that he yearns for them he he looked forward to being with them. We ought to look forward to the day that we are with our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that we're out because of the pandemic, let me just share with you, somebody ought to be longing to get back together again. Amen. We ought to long, we ought to yearn. We ought to have a desire, a heartfelt desire to get back in touch with each other again, to get back in communion with each other again. If you've been missing two, three, four months, 
from being with your brothers and sisters in Christ and you haven't thought anything of it, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Let me tell you, Paul says, I long to be with you. I love you so much. I long to be with you. And, and he goes on to call them my joy. He says, you're my gladness. You're my cheer. You're my joy. You're, the, you're my delight and you're my calmness. Paul says that brothers and sisters ought to be calmness toward each other. They ought to bring some gladness toward each other. There ought to be some delight and some cheer toward each other. Let me tell you, if you got a brother and sister in Jesus Christ, that brother and sister in Jesus Christ ought to bring some joy in your life. They ought to bring something in your life that, that you just rather have more than you want to have food. Paul says, you're my joy. You're my delight. I delight myself with you. That's why I want to be with you. We want to be around people that, that uh, bring joy in our life, that brings uh, delight, brings cheer in our life. Paul says, you are my joy. You are my crown. This word crown is a badge of royalty. You are my crown. He, he associates this crown with a prize. Paul says, you are my crown. He associates this crown with a, breed, a, a bruised wreath, a crown that the, the, the contestants used to put on their heads uh, once they have won the, in the Olympic or the Athens Games. Paul says, now I'm referring to you as my crown. He says, look, therefore, beloved brethren, my long for sought after brother, my, my brother and sister that I yearn for, you're my joy. You're my crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my beloved. He says, stand fast. Whatever you do, you see situations, situations that Paul day wasn't all good situations. Matter of fact, in this writing, Paul is not writing under good circumstances. Now, we live today and we, we operate today from a church setting that is remote from what we're usually operating from. So situations are not what we would really have them. Because we know the members of the New Beginning Church, as well as members of other churches, are longing to be together. But for safety reasons. For obedient reasons, we are separated and we are coming to you today from a distant place, from a remote location. He says, stand fast in the Lord. Whatever you do, support the principles of God. Now, just because we're not in church, we ought to still be the same people of God, even though church is not going on. Amen. We ought to be the same people. We, we ought to live the same way. We ought to act the same way. If I showed up in the grocery store and the lines are long and the teller is mistreating you, I expect to see you act in the same way in the grocery store line as you would act at the church. Just because the church doors are not open, Paul says to us that, that we are to stand fast in the Lord. Not only do we stand fast in the Lord when situations are not good for us, we ought to stand fast in the Lord because we are the beloved of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we ought to act like we are the beloved. We ought to act like we represent Christ and we ought to represent him well. When we look at verses 2 through, through verse 3, Paul deals with an issue. Can you imagine your church has an issue? Can you imagine people in your church having problems? Can you imagine people in your church arguing? Can you imagine in a Holy Ghost filled church where the saints of God say that they are of God, they love the Lord, the saints of God are, are operating in godly gifts, the saints of God are preparing for each other, and they're celebrating the same God together, but they have issues? Are there issues at your church? Are there issues in your house? Usually when people have issues in the house, they have issues in the church. Let's look and see. Paul says, I implore you, Dora, 
Ed, I implore Sintiki. I implore these two women to be of the same mind in the Lord. Why would Paul talk about, talk about these two women? There are no issues with women at your church, is it? They're, they're, they're not women who have strategies against each other at your church, is there? Paul says to these two women, whatever you do, be of the same mind in the Lord. Amen. Well, theologians believe, and they don't talk about what the issues were, but theologians believe that these two women had some disagreements. Mm -hmm. They had some disagreements, and in the midst of Paul's letter, he stops long enough to tell these two women to come to some kind of agreement, have the same mind yes. in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Let me just share with you. We have to have the same mind. If we, we're walking with Jesus, if we, we honor him, if we love him, if we're operating for him and in his behalf, we ought to love each other. We ought to get along with each other. The Apostle Paul says to those of us in the church today, he says, whatever you do, have the same mind. Be on one accord. Have the same agreement. He says to these two women, now y'all got to fix this thing. Regardless of who started it, regardless of who was right and who was wrong, Paul, the Apostle Paul says to these two women, you all got to fix it. Yes. And as we go through these verses, we can, I, we're going to see why Paul feels confident that they will fix it and why Paul feels like they have to fix it because they walk with him. Let's look further. It says, I implore these two women that they have the same mind. Verse number three in Philippians chapter four is where we are. Verse number three, he says, and I urge you also, true champion. Now, the Bible doesn't identify who Paul is talking to. He doesn't identify who he's saying, persevere, stand firm, to, to be stationary. It doesn't identify who, they, who he is talking to when he calls them a true champion. He says that I applaud these two women that they walk with the Lord, walk with the master, come to some kind of agreement. And then he says, you who are true is the true champion. He's saying my yoke fellow. This word champion means my yoke fellow. It means my colleague. Those who are co-labor in the work together. It's a pitiful shame when we work in the Lord's work and we can't get along. He says to them, I urge you also, true champion, to help these women who labor with me in the gospel. The reason why Paul can actually talk to these two women in the midst of their, dis their disagreements is because he has history with them. They have labored with him in the good news of Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them, I know where your hearts are. I have record of what you have done for the sake of Christ. And because you've done great things for the sake of Christ, you have labored together with me. I have seen what you can do. I know where your heart is. I know what you love doing. He says to them, y'all get it together. <laughs> he goes on to say, and I urge you also, true champion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel. They labor with me. He's saying those who are, who are in the faith have to help those who are in disagreement. We got to help each other. You see, the church is no place for us to come to the conclusion that we got to stay out of your business when your business is my business. Uh-uh. In other words, we cannot watch people go the wrong way, do the wrong thing, act the wrong way, have disagreements that cause issues in the church and also that cause issues in the city. When you look at this text, the theologians believe that not only did these two women have issues among themselves, 
they have also caused disagreements in the church. Not only have they called disagreements in the church, they have also caused disagreements in the city of Philippi. What it says to us is that it's contagious. Bad blood can become contagious. What it says to us is that regardless of what goes on around us, situations will become contagious and people will always choose sides one or the other. And when people begin to choose sides, it becomes become a split right down the middle of the church and of the city. Right. Theologians believe that this thing had become so contagious until it was messing up the church. It was messing up the city. It was messing up their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also not only did they labor with him, he also they also labored with others in the gospel ministry. Mm -hmm. And they labored with the fellow workers, the co-laborers. They labored with the fellow workers also. Now, Paul is not talking about somebody just showed up in church and just got to be a part of church. He's talking about women who have history. He's talking about these two women that he mentioned in verse number two. He's saying they have history in the church. They have history in the ministry. These are not pew members. Mm -hmm. And I, I contend that we ought not have any pew members anyway because there's no such thing as pew members. These are members of the church who have constructively moved the church ministry forward. Right. And now they have issues. Not only do they have issues among each other, they have caused these issues to bring spots in the church. Amen. And it has, it has overshadowed their little personal issues have overshadowed even the city of Philippi. Paul's trying to set this thing straight. And he's reminding the church members, he's reminding the champions, the co-laborers, that these women have done great things. Right now they're having issues. He's saying to the members of the church at Philippi, you all get together and you all help these women out. Somebody got to help them out because they labor with me. They labor with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. In other words, these women have labored with Paul, they've labored with others who are still living, and they labored with those who are dead, and not only that, they've labored with those who are of the Lord, so much so that their names are written in the book of life. Amen. My question, if, if you were present with me today, I'll stop right here and ask the question. Is your name written in the book of life? Yes. Is your name on the road? You see, God is not calling numbers. God is calling us by our names. Mm -hmm. your, my question is, is your name written in the book? Yes. And if, if your name is not written in the book, we can set that straight right now. We, all you have to do is believe the story yes. that Jesus died for your sin. He was buried on a borrowed, uh, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose early that third day morning. The Bible says, if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, his only begotten son, his only unique son that died on a skull hill called Calvary and rose from the dead, you can be saved right now. You can be born again right now. Yes. And then your name is written in the book of life. Yes. Meaning that when you die, you... You can go to heaven when you die. Is your name written? There was a song out by the William Brothers and, and a local pastor here, Pastor Jimmy, Jimmy Dixon. There was a song out back in the 90s. And the song asked the question, are you saved? The song, the song went kind of like, 
Is your name written in the book? Yes. Are you saved? He says over and over again, it wasn't a lot of words in the song, but they asked the question over and over again. The question was, are you saved? Is your name written in the book? And then he says, are you saved? Ask the question again. And then they say, I really want to know. I really, really have to know. I really, really got to know. Are you saved? I, I asked you that question tonight. Are you saved? And I really need to know. I really got to know. Is your name written in the book of life? Because when we leave here, we need our names written in the book of life. Amen. That we can live with God from now on. Verse number four, Philippians chapter four, verse number four. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Paul says, have joy over and over again. Now he comes out of verse three trying to set the record straight and make sure that these women are back on the right page with the Lord. And he's trying to make sure that the church does not take for granted that there are problems in the church. And when there are problems in the church, Paul admonishes the church at Philippi to help each other out. He says, you all help these out. They have worked with the ministry. They have supported the ministry. They have given to the ministry. And they have been co laborers in the ministry. And because of that, they're not worthy to be thrown away. They are worthy to be helped out. Amen. Then he says, rejoice. Mm -hmm. Rejoice in the Lord. He says, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. This word rejoice is also a word of farewell. Paul knew that shortly he would die. So this word rejoice is a, a word of farewell. He, he, he's saying, be glad. He's saying, be calm, be happy. He's saying, well off. Rejoice. He says, be well off. Be, be well off. Now, let me tell you, if anybody had anything in any reason to be worried, it was the Apostle Paul. It was the Apostle Paul. He had a reason to be worried. Nero's chopping block outside the door. He can hear it singing. Zoo, zoo, zoo. A man locked in prison mm -hmm. took his time to write a book and several books to tell us to rejoice. Yes. What he's saying to us today is the little issues we think we have is nothing compared to what he's going through. Yes. Matter of fact, it is nothing compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, regardless of what comes up. If these women get on course, rejoice. If these women don't get on course, rejoice. Yes. If, if the church goes the way you think it'll go, rejoice. If it doesn't go the way you think it should go, rejoice. If this world doesn't straighten out anytime soon, rejoice. It says to us, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice Amen. in the Lord. And he says, do it all the time. Mm -hmm. Rejoice always. If you got issues that, that are disturbing to you, rejoice in the Lord. Yes. Let your gentleness, let your gentleness, and, and some version would say your moderation, let your patience, let your gentleness be known to all men. Let your moderation, let your patience be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Amen. Let, let what you go through carry yourself in such a manner that the people will know that the Lord is at hand. Mm -hmm. When they ask you why you go through and how you go through what you're going through, just remind them the Lord is at hand. Yes. When they say, how did you get through that tough time? How did, you, how did you set things right with the Lord? Just tell them the Lord is at hand. Amen. Remind them that some of the things that go on with me, if it had not been for the Lord, I couldn't have carried it myself. Yes. Yes. 
See, oftentimes we find ourselves getting to a point where we think we can handle it ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can do it on our own. We can make it by ourselves. But you need to rejoice in the Lord and you need to make sure that your gentleness is known to all men. In other words, you're dependent on the Lord to carry you through. Amen. If I hadn't been dependent on the Lord, I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> My intelligence couldn't get me there. My degrees couldn't get me there. My diploma couldn't get me there. I had to take my time, be patient, and trust in the Lord. Yes, Lord. Maybe somebody listening to me today that's going through a real tough time, a time that you've never gone through before. Mm -hmm. It's time for you to trust in the Lord. Amen. It, it is time for you to let everybody around you know as a testimony that the Lord is at hand. Yes. Nobody can do it like Jesus can, and nobody has done what Jesus has done. Amen. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. So you need to walk around and let folk know that whatever I've gone through, whatever I've been, ex been accepted to, whatever I've been successful in doing, it's because the Lord is at hand. That way you can't brag on you. You brag on the Lord. That's right. Says the Lord is at hand. Verse number six. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Amen. Look at Paul. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry. I told you. If anybody had anything to worry about, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul says, don't worry. Be happy. Amen. Paul declares, don't be anxious for anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't let the cares of this world, the things that go on in your mind, the thoughts, take over you. Yes. Don't worry. He says... Whatever you do, don't be anxious. Don't, don't, don't worry about things. Don't, some people worry about every little thing. Mm -hmm. Somebody today is worried about the stock market. Right. Somebody today is worried about the next president. And somebody today is worried about how black and brown people are being treated in the United States of America. Paul offers an answer here today. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Let the world know that the Lord is at hand. And then he says to us, be anxious of nothing, for nothing, for in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to the Lord. Let's just unpack this thing called prayer. First of all, prayer is not just a monologue. Prayer is not a monologue where you talk to God, give God your grocery list, give God your needs, and then go on about your business. Amen. Matter of fact, prayer, first of all, is adoration. Secondly, prayer is devotion. And thirdly, prayer is worship. Prayer is adoration. Prayer is devotion, and prayer is also worship. When things are not going right in your life, you need to pray. When things are going right in your life, you need to pray. Amen. When things are so-so in your life, you need to pray. Amen. Paul declares prayer is ad adoration, adoring him magnify him, adore him. We ought to adore God. We ought to see the greatness of God and stop seeing the negativity around us. Right. We have to get to a point where we adore him. That's why Jesus says, when you pray, you ought to pray like this, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, holy God. Mm -hmm. We praise you for who you are. See, sometimes we don't thank God for anything until he does something that we can see and something that we've been asking him for. You need to spend time adoring him. Amen. You need to see his majesty. 
You need to see his greatness. You need to see that whatever God has for you, he can bless you with it. But before you ask him for anything, you ought to honor who he is. There is no God like our God. You see, prayer always touches the heart of God, but it is not a monologue. It is a dialogue where we talk to God and God talks to us. It is a fellowship. It is a worship time. Our prayer time ought to be time to just say, Lord, we adore you. We thank you, Lord. We, we glorify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. We lift you up before men. We make you big before those around us. Lord, we glorify you for you are God. We magnify you. We see your majestic moves, Lord. We see you doing things that no one else can do. God, we magnify you. We glorify you, Lord. You are the majestic one. You are God alone. You, we thank you for just being God. That's before you ask for anything. That, that's before you tell him anything. You just glorify him. Oh, hallowed to your name, Lord. God, we glorify you. We, we lift your name, Father God. We blow you up and we make you yes. big. We magnify you before other men so other men can glorify you. Yes. We need to honor him as God. Not the bellhop, but as God. Yes. Not the one who, who gives us what we want, but honor him as God. So when things are not going right for you, you ought to be honoring him as God because prayer is not only adoration, it's devotion. Yes. We ought to have some devoted time for God and for God alone. And thirdly, we ought to worship him. Prayer is worship. Prayer is worship. When, when things are not going right, and I'm telling you, we can look at the world in which we are li living in today, and a lot of things are not going right. I want to tell you, this is time for prayer. In other words, this is time to worship him. We need to worship God. Why we worship him? Because when we do need something from him, we acknowledge to him ahead of time that he is big enough to handle our problems. That God is strong enough to handle our issues. That God is able enough to solve our issues. We need to be in deep reference unto God. God, we, we welcome you. We, we glorify you. We we lift your name, Father God. We reverence you for you are God. No, you're not the one that just give us what we want, but you are God. There is none like you. You are God alone. And I thank you, Lord, for just being God. You want, you want, a, you want a new friend, a new man, a new woman, a new car, a new house. Forget all that. A new child. Forget all that and just honor him as God. Amen. He's God alone. He is the majesty himself. He is the supreme one. He's God. Paul says, whatever you do, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. Prayer, adoration. Prayer, devotion. Prayer, worship. Then he says, not only should you have prayer, but you ought to have supplication. It is the sharing of our issues. And many times when we go into supplication, we are, we are calling on God, not just for ourselves, but for other people also. Today, we ought to be calling on God to, to intervene. <laughs> we need to be calling on God to, to bless this world and this nation. We, we ought to be, and this is the time when we supplicate, we ought to be lingering in prayer with God. When we supplicate, as I told you, that prayer is a deep reverence to God, supplication is a deep intensity with God. Supplication is when, when we acknowledge God for who he is, that he's big enough to handle our issues. When we supplicate, we pray. The Bible says that Jesus had sweat running down like drops of blood because he was in tune with God. He supplicated. He, he prayed, Lord, if, 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 if I had it my way, 
I would do it this way. Lord, if I had it my way, this cup, I wouldn't allow to keep coming. But not my will, Lord. Amen. Your will be done. In supplication, we submit to the will of God. In supplication, we call on God with great intensity, trusting that God has the right answer and we have the wrong answer. Amen. When we supplicate, it's a spiritual intensity that we're calling on God and asking God to bless us now and asking God to bless our families now, asking God to bless our city, asking God to bless our state and our nation and bless this whole world. We need to call on God because he is the one who can handle it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We know the legislature can't handle it. Yes, sir. We know Republicans nor Democrats nor independents can handle it. But we have a God that's neither Republican nor Democratic. Right. <laughs> he is God and he can handle it. And so why call on people who can't handle it? Yes, we need to call on the God who can fix it. Mm -hmm. And God, it looks like the devil is winning. Oh, Jesus. But God, I know you're still on the throne. I need you, God, to fix it. Amen. The story is told by a young, a, a old lady that went on an airplane flight that was intensely related to God. She she talked to God on a regular basis. And when she called on God, God answered her prayer. She was on a flight and the flight was about 30,000 feet in the air. The captain came over the intercom system and he said, make sure everybody sits down, buckle your seats, we're flying into some turbulence. And sure enough, they flew into some turbulence. That turbulence threw that plane up and down, sideways to sideways. There was great turbulence. Mm -hmm. This old lady bowed her head and said, God, you know what's going on up here. I don't like it. I'm asking you to fix it. And many of us pray that prayer in desperation. But it's better to pray the prayer in desperation than not call on the right fellow at all. Amen. Too often, we, we concern ourselves with, with the pilot and the co-pilot. We concern ourselves with, with who's sitting next to us. We need to concern ourselves to the one who made the, the skies. Amen. We need to concern ourselves with the one who made the wind and the turbulence. If we can get the attention through supplication of the one who made it, who created the world and all that's in it, then we can succeed. We need to be calling on him with great intensity. Amen. And as the devil raises his head more and more, the Christian church ought to be more intensified to call on the Lord. As the devil peeks his head up and as the devil tries to rule over us, we need to go tell God about it. Amen. We need to make sure we pray with great supplication and call on God. The next thing that points out, that Paul points out, is that we, would, we ought to pray with thanksgiving. We ought to be appreciative. <laughs> we, we ought to thank God. See, we get so involved in our stuff until we don't appreciate what God is already doing. We ought to just say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for what you've given me. Lord, I thank you for the shoes. I thank you for the clothes. I thank you for the food. I thank you, Lord. No Christian should ever, 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 ever eat anything without thanking the Lord for it and asking the Lord to bless it. When I, was, when I was a young man, I was walking around the church and I had a soda. Some of you call it pop. Some people call it soda water. I had a soda water in my hand. I think that's what they call it here in, in, in the Texas region. I had a soda water, a soda pop in my hand. And I stopped at the foot of the stairway right before I went up to the second floor at the church. And I asked the Lord to bless my drink. And I thanked the Lord for my drink. One of the youth that, that uh, I was counseling with, that I was his youth counselor, walked around the corner and he said, man, you, you thank the Lord for your soda? 
I said, yeah, anything before it enter into my system, I need to thank the Lord for it, and I need the Lord to bless it. Amen. Every breath meant, Lord, I thank you, mm -hmm. and I ask you to bless it. See, we have to have an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of thanking God for what he's already done, thanking God for what he's going to do, thanking the God, for God for what he's doing right now. We ought to have a thanksgiving attitude in our lives. One of the biggest issues, and let me tell you, one of the biggest issues with our young people these days is that they're not grateful for what they already have. Just the other day, a boy turned 21 years old, and because he didn't get the latest, greatest car that he thought he should have gotten for his birthday, he pushed a brand new car, a brand new car, into the river and said, that's not the car I wanted. Now, you know he was in the wrong household. Because that investment that he just pushed into the lake would have been where he would have been living the rest of his life. If he was in the right household, he wouldn't get anything. He wouldn't get a glass of water. He wouldn't be allowed at the house because he is too ungrateful. He takes a car that his mom and his dad had saved money to buy and drove it to the edge of the cliff and let it float it off into the river. And his explanation was, that's not the car I wanted for my birthday. All he would have known is one thing. Every car you get from this day forward, if it's a horse-drawn wagon, you will pay for it. Amen. It's because we have created monsters who do not appreciate anything, and it has been passed on into their Christian lives where we don't appreciate what God is doing. We ought to be thankful. We ought to be blessing God and thanksgiving. If you've had surgery and you walked out of there, Lord, I thank you. If they made a mistake, you ought to say, Lord, I thank you. If, if, if life is not what you would have it to be, but you're still on top of the ground and the ground's not on top of you, say, Lord, I thank you. Because God is always saving us from ourselves and saving us from other folk. Who knows if God had given us what we've asked for for so long, where would we be now? Amen. And then would we have made that which we asked for our God? God is wise and we ought to be thankful for whatever he does. He says in verse number six, let your request be made known to God. Mm -hmm. When you do want something, you tell God about it. Too often we, we tweet it, we Facebook it, we DM it, we message it, and we're not talking to God about it. Paul says to the church, as he says to us today, that whatever you do, let your request be made known to God. God, the supreme one, God, the, the great one, God, the one who makes things better for us. Tell that God about it. God, God, who's our master, he, he is the supreme one in authority. Yes. Tell the Lord about it. He's our owner. Tell the Lord about it. He's our controller. Tell God about it. Make your request known, not to man, but to God. Yes. Let your request be made known unto God. Then finally, verse number seven, Philippians chapter four. Verse number seven, and he says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul says this word peace, this quietness, word peace means to set at one again. You see, we, we have very, very low peace when we don't have the Lord, when we don't have God. Paul says the peace that God has surpasses, surpasses means to excel, means it's higher. Matter of fact, Paul says this word surpasses means that the peace of God is supreme. It's above all. 
You thought that Tyrone was your answer. You thought that Shaquita was your answer. But let me just share with you. God is the one who gives us peace. He sets us at one again. He gives us quietness. It's amazing to, to find out that people have cow king beds and don't get an ounce of sleep. You can have a mansion of a house and never have peace. You can have the right man you thought you needed, the right woman you thought you had to have, and never have peace. The peace of God surpasses, it excels. It is higher. It is supremer than any other peace that you would ever imagine. Amen. It says that in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. You see, Paul is talking to the church at Philippi, and he understands that there are issues in the church. But he wants the church to know that you have to lean on God in order to have peace, in order to have quietness, in order to be set at one again. The church was in turmoil, mm -hmm. but it takes God and his peace to set the church at one again, yes. on one accord again. This word surpasses means that God is able to excel anything, any peace, any quietness that you can ever come up with. It surpasses our understanding. This understanding is our intellect. You see, God is infinite, meaning that he has no ending. Matter of fact, God has no beginning, neither does he have an ending. And we are finite, meaning that we have a beginning and we have an end. Our intellect, our understanding is limited. This word, this word understanding is, is feelings, our humanity, what we mean in our heart. It is limited. And because we are limited people, we need a, a, a God who is not limited. Because we are finite, we need an infinite God. And this infinite God will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. This infinite God will guard your heart. He will guard your mind by way of Christ Jesus. There's no other way to have your heart guarded. There's no other way to have peace other than Christ Jesus. So you ought to be waking up with the word of God. You ought to be going to sleep at night with the word of God. Let me just share with you. Last night, I, I understand now, I understand real well now. When social justice is injustice. I understand when people say that it makes me want to vomit when I see someone mistreated. As we've seen in the last 48 hours. It makes me want to vomit. And it is these times that I ask the Lord, Lord, when are you coming? Lord, when you're going to set it at once again? Lord, when are you going to be our Messiah and rescue us from this? Yes, Jesus. But I know that God is at work behind the scenes. Yes, he is. He's working behind the curtain. He, he is working before the curtain is drawn. God is going to set straight and set at once again. Man, man who is doing whatever they want to do right now, don't worry about it. The peace of God will excel. He, the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep our hearts and our mind in Christ Jesus. I wonder today, how do people make it without God? <laughs> there is enough happening around us today to lose our mind. But the peace of God is keeping us. God himself, with his excellency, is keeping us. He's guarding our hearts. He's guarding our mind. The old saints back home would say, 
that he's blessing us through danger seen and unseen. There's stuff going on around us that we don't even know about. God is just blocking it. God is just stopping it. God is just setting up blockades and boundaries and holding the devil back. For the devil would love to have his way. But the peace of God is keeping us. It's God in our hearts. I'm going to tell you, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I would have lost my mind a long time ago. Somebody still think I've lost my mind. But, but the peace of God has kept me sane. The peace of God has guarded my heart where my heart is not callous. My heart is not turned against all mankind. God has kept us. So in, in, instead of watching ABC, CBS, NBC, SMNBC, CNN, Bounce, MTV. Get in the word and let the peace of God keep your mind. The word of God, the peace of God will keep you in perfect peace if your mind just stay on Jesus. There may be somebody listening to me today that's in trouble. Don't have peace. I recommend Jesus. Amen. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, the conquering King of Calvary. I recommend Jesus. Jesus, who died over 2,000 years ago. I suggest that you, I recommend that you, I implore you, I, I request, I beseech you to try Jesus. He's a way maker. He, he's made a way so many times for me and so many others. Trust him. And if you've never received him, you can do that right now. The door of the church is open. Just trust Jesus as your savior. Believe him as your Lord. Work and be a part of what God is doing. Just trust Jesus as your savior. You can do that tonight without a church building, without a choir, without a drama or organist or a pianist. You can get to know Jesus for yourself. The door of the church is open. If you want to invite him in, you can do so right now. Just join me in prayer and invite Jesus into your life. It's a simple prayer. Just, just repeat after me as I lead you in prayer. And the only thing we're going to say is, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. And we believe that if you believe the story that you're born again and you're on your way to heaven. Would you join me in prayer? Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe that if you prayed this prayer, you invited Jesus into your life. We believe that you're born again. And when you die, you go to heaven when you die. There may be somebody else listening to me who don't have a church home. Or you're in between church homes. I recommend the New Beginning Church. Where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. But well, Jesus is the captain of the ship. Everybody needs a church home. 
Somebody may have made you mad, but you need a church home. You may not have ever gone to church before on a consistent basis, but you need a church home. Foxes have holes, that's their homes. Birds of the air have nests, that's their homes. Every person needs a church home. If you've joined me tonight and received Jesus Christ as your Savior, message me and let me know that you received him. If you've joined the New Beginning Church tonight, message me and let me know that you are now a part of the body of Christ, known as the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. I'll be glad to hear from you. And you'll be glad to be a part of this body of Christ and this body of believers. We're at that point where we offer you the privilege and the opportunity to sow into this ministry, to give to this ministry. Those who are members of the New Beginning Church, this is your time to give unto the Lord by way of tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. And you can do so by our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls, NBC Souls. Cash tag, NBC Soul. You can do so by our cash app and come and give to the Lord. We'll be glad to, to co-labor with you financially unto the Lord. Or you can mail your offerings to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. We'll be glad to share ministry with you and we'll be glad for you to share ministry with us. We look forward to seeing you every Sunday in our live broadcast right here, same stations. 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Our Sunday school teachers, as well as myself, will be laying out the Sunday school lesson at 9 a.m. And then you can join us at our 1045 worship service on the air at 1045 a.m. every Sunday. And then tonight, Wednesday night, as it is every Wednesday night, you can join us at 7, 7.20 p.m. for our Bible study. We appreciate you being with us here tonight. We thank you for being a part of our service. Please come and celebrate with us again. We'll be glad to have you. And we'll be glad that you've come to share with us. We believe that God is doing great things at the New Beginning Church and he's operating even in our nation behind the scene. And as he's operating behind the scene, we believe that God has the answer for every ailment that we may have. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We're looking forward to, to seeing you and fellowshipping with you again this coming Sunday at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 1045 a.m for our worship service. And then we'll be back here again on Wednesday night at 720. To our visitors, thank you for being a part of our service. To our members, thank you for being faithful. And those of you who are mailing in your tithes and offering, thank you. Those of you who are sending in tithes and offering by way of cash out, thank you. God is blessing us and we want to give back to him. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, that when there are issues in the congregation, that the peace of God will surpass all understanding. Everything we know to do, we think we know how to act. We thank you for the peace of God. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen and praise the Lord. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Thank you again for joining with us.